Yes, you're listening to the Total Cricket Podcast. I hope you're having a good one. Sachin here, as always, to take you through the latest happenings in the world of cricket. And today, I'm going to be putting the second ODI between India and Australia under the microscope. India won this one by 50 runs once again. They were able to defend a relatively small total by today's standards. And for Australia, a damaging defeat that makes it very difficult for them to mount a comeback in this series. Now I'll begin with the team news. India, they went in unchanged. Australia, they made two changes with Adam Zampa and also James Faulkner dropping out for Kane Richardson and Ashton Agar. Now let's get into the recap of the game. And India, they won the toss on what was a two-paced surface at Eden Gardens. No surprises there, given the amount of rain we saw in the build-up to the game. The ground staff weren't able to prepare the pitch as much as they would have liked. It was a little bit underdone, stayed under covers for quite a while, and as such, we saw that tacky nature to the pitch. Incredibly, Virat Kohli has now elected to bat first in three consecutive games, certainly a deviation from his usual tactic. I think part of that is he's trying to experiment a little bit. I think that India favour chasing, but they want to have a go at trying to defend a total and part of it definitely down to the pitch. But nevertheless, India managed to get what seemed a pass score on this surface, 252 all out. They managed the partnership between Virat Kohli and Ajinkya Rahane was key to this innings. Kohli managing 92, Rahane getting 55. But the innings fell apart towards the end. They lost seven wickets for just the 67 runs in the last 15 overs, India. So certainly they left a few runs out on the field. The Australian bowling, the pace bowlers did the bulk of the damage. Pat Cummins, very good once again, one for 34. Nathan Coulter-Nile and Kane Richardson got three wickets apiece. Marcus Stoinis went wicketless. And Ashton Agar, he got the other wicket. Australia, in reply, it looked like they had a pretty good chance to win this game. But once again, they were outdone by India's wrist spinners. They were looking pretty good when Stephen Smith and Marcus Stoinis were batting together. But as soon as Steve Smith got out, the wheels fell off the innings completely. Very little in the way of contributions apart from those two. Steve Smith, 59. Marcus Stoinis left stranded on 62, not out. Once again, a batting collapse for Australia, proving costly in Asia. The Indian bowlers, Bhuvneshwar Kumar, was basically unplayable. Three for nine. He took incredible stuff. Jasprit Bumrah didn't manage a wicket, but Hardik Pandya got a couple. But then it was down to the wrist-spinning duo of Yuzvendra Chahal and Kuldeep Yadav getting two and three wickets, respectively, including a hat-trick for Kuldeep Yadav. Unbelievable stuff. The first hat-trick by an Indian in ODIs since 1991. Now let's get into the breakdown and the Indian innings. They did pretty well, I thought, given the conditions, but it could have been a lot better if the innings hadn't completely stalled towards the back end. I'll begin with Ajinkya Rahane, and he did a good job with 55 of 64. He looked set for a three-figure score, but then he got run out. I think he was a little bit slow on that one, a little bit lazy, I feel. But Rahane has a tough gig in this Indian ODI team. He's the backup opener. He's in a very difficult position because the opening duo of Roit Sharma and Chikadavan is set in stone. If you remember, after the ODI series against the West Indies, where Rahane was man of the match, when Roy Sharma returned to fitness for the Sri Lankan series, he was straight out of the team. And unfortunately, that's just the situation that Rahane finds himself in. That's his role in this team. He's a backup to these two elite openers. But he did a good job in this game for sure. I thought that given the circumstances, this was a perfect type of game for him. It was a slowish pitch and you needed to build your innings with a little bit more caution than usual. So that certainly played into his hands. And I thought that he played in a very calculated manner. Remember the first game, how he got out with a full-blooded drive, nicking off. This time, he reined himself in a little bit and played closer to his body. I like that a lot from Ajinkya Rahane. And he's doing a good job as the backup opener. But unfortunately, that's all he's going to be in this Indian setup. Roy Sharma. Once again, pace at the start of the innings, proving his downfall, tipped one straight back to Nathan Coulton after seven. And this is his one big weakness, Roy Sharma, the reason why he's 
in and out of the test team a lot of the time. He doesn't play the pace when it's moving around particularly well. He has a few technical flaws like planting that front foot and just fishing at the deliveries going across him with little foot movement. So certainly he needs to look at that Rohit Sharma. Virat Kohli once again steered the ship for India 92 off 107 deliveries. I'm very surprised that he didn't go on to make 100. He chopped one on from Nathan Coulter. Really the ball was a little bit too close to him. Nipped back in and he paid the price for that. But Kohli did an incredible job. Again, just like Rahane summed up the conditions and played a percentage innings. That's why Kohli is so good. He plays basically risk-free cricket. There's no unorthodox strokes. There's no big hits. It's just good, solid batting. Hitting the gaps and running hard between the wickets are his modus operandi in ODIs. Australia once again tried the light of off stump ploy to him, but today he was equal to it. He decided to move across his crease a little bit more, play the ball closer to his body, and as such, he got more balls to work into the leg side. That's his favourite scoring area. Good to see Virat Kohli adapting, trying to work on that weakness of his. Big plus today, certainly. And nowadays, we hear Kohli being compared to the greats of the ODI game, like A.B. de Villiers, Sachin Tendulkar, Viv Richards, Sanat Jayasuriya. And to me, he deserves to be compared to these kinds of people. Now, I don't think you can say he's definitively the best ODI batsman ever, because since ODI cricket started in 1971, the game has changed so much. It's so difficult to compare between eras. And this era is the most productive for batsmen. But that doesn't mean that Kohli shouldn't be compared to these types of players. He's only halfway through his career and he's getting compared to these players. It will be interesting to see how he's viewed when his career ends. Manish Pandey, he only managed three and he has looked very shaky against the Australian fastballs, but he got out to Ashton Agar. He was bold, trying to play a cut that was way too close to his body. And for Manish Pandey, He's only scored four runs in the two games so far. But here's the thing for India's number four conundrum. They have the luxury of giving Pandey a long run in the team, I feel. That top three is very, very clear. You know Dhoni's going to bat at six, Hardik's going to bat at seven, or at least be a floater in the batting order depending on the situation. Those number four and five slots are the only question marks in this Indian batting order. And as such, they can give Pandi a longer rope. Not to mention that this team is winning basically every game. They've now won eight ODIs in a row. This is the luxury you have. And I think it would be fair to Pandi to give him a proper go. He looked good in Sri Lanka, has struggled against the Aussies so far. But let's see him now for the rest of this series against New Zealand, against Sri Lanka. I think he deserves a go. He's clearly got a lot of talent. If you do remember, he scored a hundred against this very same opposition the last time. These two played in a bilateral series. So for Manish Pandey, he needs to figure out his plans a little bit more to pace, I feel. I think he's a little bit unsure of himself, a little bit tentative. He needs to be more positive in his play. Kedar Jadav, he looked good. Once again, got a start, but he couldn't quite convert 24 off 24. And he sort of squirted one to Maxwell at point off Kul Tanar. But for Kedar Jadav, I like him in that number five slot when he combines that aggressive approach with a little bit of caution at the start of his innings. I think he's a very good player. When he gets that balance right, then I think India's got a good option there because that top order is going to score the bulk of your runs. And if he's coming in late, he's a great guy to have to get quick runs down the order. And now he's starting to show that he can also do a rebuilding job. So I like the versatility that he brings to this batting lineup. Mahendra Singh Dhoni, a rare failure for MS in this one. He only managed the five, and I think that was the thing that derailed India's innings. He's so crucial in finishing off the Indian innings, Dhoni. He doesn't score at a huge rate nowadays, but just his presence alone impacts the batsman at the other end, as well as the opposition. And I think this showed Dhoni's value once again to the team through his failure. He chipped one to Steve Smith off Kane Richardson. Definitely was a little bit quick onto that delivery. 
Hardik Pandya came in when the Indian innings was starting to fall apart a little bit. And this was a different innings from Hardik. wasn't the usual smash and bash. Admittedly, it was a lot more difficult for him to do that given the pitch. But I thought he did a good job still. The fact of the matter was, when Dhoni was dismissed at 204 for 6, India could have easily been bundled up for 220. But he, along with Bhuvneshwar Kumar, made sure that India got to that 250 mark. They assessed the conditions well, thought, OK, on this pitch, we could definitely defend 250. And that's what they aimed for. They played smart cricket, and those two put on a crucial 35 for the seventh wicket. And yes, it may have come in very slow time, 53 balls, but it was crucial that they didn't fall apart. And this was a good sign from Hardik to show a different side to his game, someone who we know is such an X factor. But for him to pull back a bit, adapt to the situation, I think that was a big plus for India. You want an intelligent cricketer who has good game awareness, and Hardik showed that today, as did Bhuvaneshwar. As I said, he's a very useful guy to have down the order because he can hit the boundaries, but he can also defend when necessary and just maneuver the strike to the more recognized batsman. So I think a good job by those two down the order. On to the Australian bowling. Pat Cummins once again, fantastic. The Indians are clearly very wary of Pat Cummins. They're not giving him their wickets, but he is not giving them any runs. It's that classic case of looking at the opposition's best bowler and trying not to give him a hat full of wickets. That's what India did, but Pat Cummins, bowling the way he is in Asia, is a great sign. We know how talented he is. It's just a case of him staying on the path. He's still only 24 years old, would you believe? He's got a lot of cricket ahead of him, and I think that Australia, if they lose the series early, either in the third ODI or the fourth ODI, I think they would be smart to rest Cummins for the rest of the series. They've already said that they're giving him the 2020s off, but I would want to take as little risk as possible, particularly if it's a dead rubber with the ashes coming up. Your fast bowling stocks are already pretty diminished with Stark, Hazelwood and Pattinson all currently injured. I don't think Australia should be taking any risks with this guy. Nathan Coulter again picked up three wickets and he was a big threat with the new ball once again, accounting for Rohit Sharma up front. And then coming back to strike in the middle overs to remove Kohli and Kedar Jadav in pretty quick succession. And those two wickets started the rot for India. I like Nathan Cool to now again. Incredibly, he's not a first choice option for Australia. But with the new ball, he can swing it away at great pace. He's got a searing Yorker at the death. And he showed another string to his bow in this game in the middle overs. He was able to get some seam movement on a helpful surface, admittedly. But that's really good from Cool to now to be able to bowl pretty well at the start of the innings, the middle overs, and the death overs. Every captain wants a bowler like that. So big plus Nathan Kultanal so far in this series for the Aussies. Kane Richardson, a guy who's been on the fringes for quite a while for Australia. This is his 13th ODI. You wouldn't have thought that. He's not a guy who a lot of people know, but he is noted for his slower balls, particularly done well in the big bash for a number of years. And he did a pretty good job, I must say, coming into the team quite unexpectedly. I thought, and he accounted for the big wicket of MS Dhoni, and then he got a few more in the slog overs. Richardson, again, shows the strength in depth that this Australian fast bowling attack has, but I don't consider him to be a challenger to be in the first choice 11 when everyone's fit. Marcus Stoinis did a reasonable job. Wasn't bad, wasn't great. Average day for him as that all-rounder. I like him. As an option, he bowls reasonable pace, can get the ball to move. He's capable of extracting some bounce out of the surface. Today just wasn't his day. Ashton Agar coming into the team. This was his first ODI since 2015. Can you believe it? I don't think he bowled too well today, Ashton Agar. Went for six and over off his nine. Yes, he did get the wicket of Pandi. But in those middle overs, he needed to keep the run rate down. And he wasn't able to do that. He only went for three boundaries. But the crucial thing was that he only delivered 17 dot balls. There were a lot of singles and twos taken off him. And that kind of thing is what builds momentum in the opposition innings. Admittedly, Virat Kohli is a very difficult customer to keep quiet. But this is the issue I find with finger spinners. They don't spin the ball a great deal. 
They don't have a lot of variation. And so the batsmen are more confident in stepping out and picking their spots in the field. But I will cut Agar some slack because, as I said, he hasn't played an ODI for ages. Travis Head just bowled a couple of overs, nothing much to talk about with him. Into the Australian innings and well, well, well. Another batting collapse for the Aussies in Asia. They can't seem to take a trick, can they? It seems like if Stephen Smith or David Warner aren't going to win the game for them, no one is. There's a couple of issues for Australia here. One, this batting order is lacking experience. If you look at David Warner, he hadn't played an ODI in India before this series. Steve Smith, this was his 100th ODI only. You'd think he'd have played much more by now. And their next most experienced player is Glenn Maxwell with 79 ODIs. There simply isn't a great deal of experience in this batting order. The second thing is that the middle order isn't particularly technically proficient. Travis Head, Glenn Maxwell, Marcus Stoinis, Matthew Wade, they're not what I would call quality test or first class batsmen. They're more limited overs players and as such, against this kind of high quality spin bowling, particularly in testing conditions, they're not used to that as much as seasoned test players like your Warners or your Smiths. And the last thing I think is that it's playing on the mind of the Aussies, these collapses. They've happened so frequently that I think they're getting themselves into a little bit of a rut. It's almost like once one wicket falls to the spin, the next batsman coming in looks scared and tentative. I think they need to completely change their approach to the spin. They need to be a lot more proactive get this idea out of their mind and just focus on playing the deliveries. One thing they could do in the short term is bring Peter Hanscom into the team, a very good player of spin. That might help arrest this slide for the Aussies. But I'll start with Hilton Cartwright, and he's looked all at sea against the Indian fast bowlers opening the batting so far. Once again, only managed the one of 15 deliveries. Could not get going, Hilton Cartwright. I'm not sure opening the batting was his best chance of success. Travis Head has already opened the batting for Australia in ODIs. He has a 100 in the position. Why wasn't he put up to open? Hilton Cartwright's a middle-order batsman. I don't understand that thought process from Australia. Hilton Cartwright, seeing him in that second test against Bangladesh, he's a powerful striker of the ball, but he plays with hard hands and little foot movement. And against a rampant Bhuvneshwar Kumar, that's not really going to cut it. So I think Australia need to rethink their strategy at the top of the order. David Warner, he was all at sea as well against Bhuvneshwar Kumar. This is sometimes the issue with David Warner. He's always going to go after the ball. He's not one to leave many deliveries, and he poked at one from Kumar straight to Rahane at slips. And the issue for Warner is that he's under a lot of pressure in this team to perform. You almost get the feeling that the wickets of Warner and Smith are worth double to the Indians. Now, Steve Smith in his 100th ODI, he looked good. He was the key to Australia winning the game. But on 59, he skied one off Hardik Pandya to Ravindra Jadeja at deep square leg. And I think with that dismissal went Australia's chances of winning the game. You have to see them through there in that position, Stephen Smith. He's their captain, their best batsman. He needs to be the guy to take them to victory. And he couldn't do that in this game, Stephen Smith. I know that might be a little bit harsh, but that's the reality for this Australian team. He is under a lot of pressure to perform. And although he was playing, as you'd expect, from Steve Smith, just milking the bowling, putting the bad balls away, he couldn't finish the job. And that was a big disappointment for me. Travis Head was looking so good, 39 of 39. But then one of the softest dismissals you'll see, he just bunted a full toss straight to mid-wicket. That was a poor, poor lapse in concentration from Travis Head. Once you get that start, you need to go on. It's very difficult for the new batsman in testing conditions against high-quality wrist spin to start. So once again for Australia, the batsman failing to go on with their starts. Glenn Maxwell, what can I say about Glenn Maxwell? Managed the 14 before he was once again stumped off Yuzvendra Chahal. MS Dhoni did the rest. It was beautiful bowling from Chahal, but really a nothing shot from Glenn Maxwell. And Glenn Maxwell is one of the most frustrating cricketers in the world. He's so talented, the repertoire of strokes that he has, but he doesn't put it together 
often enough. He's been around for a long time now, Glenn Maxwell, but still he's not a dependable player for Australia. We know he's an aggressive player, but sometimes that line gets crossed and it becomes reckless. You'd think that by now he might have figured that out, but unfortunately it doesn't seem like he has. I think we all want to see more than just starts from Glenn Maxwell. I think we want to see more match-winning contributions. That's his big issue at the moment. Marcus Stoinis once again did a good salvage job. He was left stranded on 62 of 65. Admittedly, some of those runs he scored was when the game was well beyond Australia's reach. But cast your mind back to the Chapel Hadley game earlier this year where he played that incredible innings to almost single-handedly take Australia to victory. And I thought he would, but then Josh Hazelwood decided to run when there was a run not there, and he was run out. If Australia had won that game, I think that that innings by Stoinis would have been considered one of the best ever in ODI cricket. It was that good. I think Stoinis has big potential in this team to be the new Shane Watson, if you like. He's got such power in his stroke play, plays down the ground fantastically. He can also play square of the wicket, though. He's a tall man, able to ride the bounce well. He's clearly someone with a good temperament. I think he's been a big positive for Australia in this last year in ODIs. It hasn't been a good year for Australia. Cast your mind back to the start of the year. Yes, they beat Pakistan, but that was in Australia. But since then, they've played a heap of away ODIs, and boy, have they struggled. Got thrashed in South Africa 5-0. Then they went to New Zealand. They lost the Chapel Hadley series 2-1. They didn't win a game at the Champions Trophy. And now they're 2-0 down against India. So they're struggling big time in this format. And I've already mentioned it. A lot of that is just the middle order not delivering. If you have a look at these two games in this series, the bowling has restricted India pretty well. But then the batting hasn't brought home the bacon. Admittedly, there have been some mitigating factors. Like in South Africa, they rested a lot of their bowlers. In New Zealand, again, the same thing. Plus, David Warner and Steve Smith were rested. The Champions Trophy, I thought they were very unlucky with the rain. And now here again, a lot of their fast bowlers are injured. Finch is injured. They have had some issues, but that doesn't excuse entirely their performance in ODIs this year. They need to pick it up Australia big time, particularly with the batting. Speaking of picking it up, Matthew Wade, once again, not doing the job bowled by Cool Deep Yard of chopping one on. And that's five consecutive single-digit scores in ODIs for Matthew Wade. We know he struggles in the test arena. He's also been struggling in ODIs. He's not providing enough with the bat in this team. At number seven, you should be a game-breaker. You should be someone who can change the course of a game. Matthew Wade is anything but that. The issue for Australia is where are the alternatives to him? They're few and far between. He's one of the big issues as well for this Australian batting lineup, simply not pulling his weight. Then the rest of the batting, even though Australia do have a good tail, when you're coming in against high quality wrist spin, it's always going to be difficult. And it was no surprise that Ashton Agar and Pat Cummins were pretty clueless against Cool Deep Yard of getting out to him for Golden Ducks. But that was the Australian batting falling 50 runs short. I think they should have done a much better job here. Pretty disappointing performance all round. But how about that Indian bowling? Once again, defending what looked like a chaseable score. And Bhuvneshwar Kumar was absolutely incredible. At his very best in this one, three for nine he took in just the 6.1 overs, including two maidens. And the conditions were perfect for him. As I said before, this was a two-paced pitch. But then there was a little bit of rain during the interval which helped get a little bit of zip into the surface. Add to that the effect of the light, and the ball started to talk a lot for Bhuvaneshwar. And he did exactly what we know he can do. He put the ball on a string. He swung it both ways, set up the batsman to perfection. I thought the way he got Hilton Cartwright out was incredible. Using the crease to perfection there, incredible bowling from Bhuvaneshwar. An exhibition of swing bowling from him. He's turning into a very good bowler, Bhuvaneshwar, in this format of the game. So lethal up front, but now also a very good depth bowler, as we've seen in both the Champions Trophy and the IPL. Jasper Bumra wasn't his best day, didn't quite find his line and lens. That's the issue with him at the moment. 
the consistency. We know how talented he is. He's just got to start stringing more performances together. But he's still so young. There's so much time for him to become as good as he can be. Hardik Pandya, the game breaker, did it once again, getting Stephen Smith and breaking the back of the Australian chase. He picked up two wickets. Yes, he bowls boundary deliveries, but he also bowls wicket-taking deliveries. And you'd think that once again, with time, he'll start to tighten his groupings up, be a little bit more consistent. But at the moment, he's doing a great job for India, exactly what they would want. Someone who can change the game, an X factor, someone who the opposition always has to be careful of. That's what Hardik Pandya is for this Indian team. He can bowl it quick. He can bowl the bouncer. He can bowl the Yorker. He has a great cutter as well. He's got all the tricks to his play. Lastly, but certainly not least, the two wrist spinners for India once again destroying the Aussies in the middle overs. Yuzvendra Chahal was fantastic. That ball to Maxwell, wow. Two wickets for 34 for him, and he's really growing into his role, Yuzvendra. He's gaining confidence every game he's playing. As I've said before, not the biggest turn of the ball, but occasionally he does get the ball to really rip. And when that does happen, the batsman is often clueless. His strength is his accuracy. And when he adds to that, that huge turner and the occasional googly as well, he's such a big threat in the middle overs. Kuldeep Yadav, a similar story for him. A hat trick, can you believe it or not? He didn't actually bowl incredibly well apart from the hat trick, but you can't take anything away from him. This was an incredible achievement by Kuldeep. First he got played, then Ashton Agar played all around the leg spinner, and then he got Pat Cummins with the wrong and caught behind. Beautiful setup from Kuldeep. It was a joy to watch. And I've talked about it before. This is what he brings to the table. He brings surprisingly good control for a Chinaman bowler, but crucially able to turn the ball substantially in both directions. That makes it so difficult for the batsman to get on top of him. He's only 22 years old. This guy is going to be incredible. And what about this spinning debate for India? Kuldeep and Yuzvendra are blowing it wide open. They have got 10 wickets between them so far in this series. They were also very good in Sri Lanka. Kuldeep, excellent in West Indies as well. We saw Ashwin and Jadeja's struggles in the Champions Trophy. Are we seeing the changing of the guard for India? I certainly think so. The wrist spinner is just a better option nowadays. I've talked about why that is a million times. But in summary, they've got more variations and they spin the ball more in general than finger spinners. So I really hope that these two continue to perform well because I think them in the team makes India a better outfit. When you've got these X factors like Hardik Pandya, like Kuldeep Yadav, like Yuzvendra Chahal to add to the known quantities of the Rohit Sharmas, the Shikha Dhabans, the Virat Kohlis, the MS Dhonis, the Bhuvneshwar Kumars, the Jasprit Bumras. You've got an elite team. But that's it for the game. Another very good victory for India. And we move to Indoor for the third ODI. That starts today, Sunday the 24th. I can't see Australia coming back into this series. Maybe they'll win this game, but I think India have this series pretty much sewn up. But that's all from me today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, you can check it out on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. The links to all those platforms can be found on the Twitter page. But until next time, thanks for listening, and I'll see you later.